morning. A lot different though. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter number 12 this evening. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to look at the Word of God tonight. This is very serious. I want you to pay, pay me attention this evening and pray. God will just move and do what needs done here. Hebrews chapter 12. I do ask that you pray for us tonight. Everybody looking at it now? Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Compass. See that word compass? What does that look like? Compass. It's a circle. Compass you about. With a great cloud of witnesses. Who are the great cloud of witnesses? Chapter 11. All people listed in chapter 11. That's why it starts off this chapter with wherefore. A continuation of chapter 11. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin. See, there's some things that can be a weight to you, but not necessarily a sin. I hear people say, well, show me in the Bible where it says you can't show everything in the Bible. But it's a weight. It's a heavy weight you down. The sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run. See that? Let us run with patience. With patience. Remember that word now, patience. The race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. I want to see you tonight on the subject... Running the race for Jesus. Now tonight, uh, the Bible said that we're to run with patience the race that is set before us. This is a, me a message I use in revival meetings across the country. And I've, I've never preached it out here. And so I want you to listen real carefully tonight. Because it's one of them uh, special Sunday nights. The Bible said that we're to run the race. The Christian life is like a race. The Bible tells us that we're in a race. We're not racing, each we're racing the devil, we're racing time, and we're racing sin. Now, I want to say about four things about the race tonight, and uh, you, you give me your undivided attention, and the first thing I want to say is the reason for the running the race. Why do we run this race for God? When you got saved, when I got saved, uh, and when I was 18 years old, the Lord put me on the track, and He said, all right, Danny, Run. I've been running the race for the Lord all these years. I've run through mud holes and over bushes and, and logs and, and went through briar thickets and, and, uh, and, and you name it, quicksand and hard top and soft top and snow and ice and desert and everything. But we're still running for God. The fact that you're here tonight, up singing in the choir, working on a bus, doing something for God, you're running the race for Jesus. So tonight, we're talking about the running uh, reasons for running this race. First of all, we look at the great cloud of witnesses. In chapter 11, the Bible names all these great people. It said, by faith, Noah, being, uh, being warned of God, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Think about that. Here's old Noah out there building the ark nearly uh, 4,000 years ago. And Noah built the ark, saw the flood, saw the devastation, saw the world damaged or drowned, destroyed, and saw the damage. Got out, started the world over again. Can you imagine? If Noah is in chapter 11 and chapter 12 says, we're compassed with a great cloud of witnesses, Noah is in the great grandstands of glory tonight yeah. cheering us on. Now, I've heard preachers argue this different ways, and I can't prove it, but I do tend to believe, I'm not sure, but that, that, that said, it said all this stuff in chapter 11, and then chapter 12 said, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about. So it strongly, strongly indicates that somehow or another, 
God has a great big balconies in heaven all the way around us. And the people in heaven are up there tonight yeah. saying, Go, man, go. Yeah. Is that the best you can do, Castle? Come on. Let's go, boy. And I'm saying, I'm just in a human body. I'm going to do better in a minute if the Lord will help me. And they're saying, Go, boy, go, go, go. My dad, who went to heaven 13 years ago, is there saying, Son, if you don't do better than this, I'm going to beat you when you get home. My sister, who went home to be with the Lord 13 years ago, uh, is up there saying the same thing. I mean, you think about that. That's encouraging tonight to think that the saints of God. I've had people say, Well, you believe people in heaven see what's going on down here? Somehow or another, they get to see us run the race. I don't think they get to see the sin. I don't think they get to see the heartache. There's no sorrow where they are. But somehow or another, the Lord says, take a look down there. And they look out and say, shine in light. Let's go. Let's go run them buses, preach them sermons, sing them songs. Hallelujah. Amen. The great cloud of witnesses. You think about that. The great cloud. Now, the race you and I are in tonight is a relay race. Have you ever run a relay race? A relay race is like this. Somebody took the torch and the Lord lit the torch. And... Um, and the Lord lit this torch, and this torch was on fire. And He took this, and the Lord says, All right, apostles, you go. Here goes Peter, James, and John, and all them, and preaching the gospel to every creature. And so when they start running, they start running with that torch, and then they pass it on. And you know who they pass it on to? They pass it on to the church fathers. And they hand it on to the church fathers, the people who overlap the apostles. That's who they pass it on to. They take off running. Boy, here they go, and they're running here, and they're running there, and through the early days, you know, and then they passed it on to some great preachers in the past. They passed it on to D.L. Moody. Yeah. They passed it on to Charles Spurgeon. Yeah. They passed it on to George Whitfield and Charles Finney and yeah. all them preachers like that. And they run, run and run. Somebody crossed 1900. They come around, somebody passed it to uh, Billy Sunday yeah. and uh, Mordecai Ham and Billy Graham and all them preachers got it and boy, they passed it on. Somebody gave it back in the 40s to an old preacher by the name of Joe Parson. And Carson prayed all over this country and come to Nebo and preached revival and I got saved. And Joe handed it to me and I took off running. And boy, I took off a running like this. Whoa, hallelujah. Like that, you know, I'm just running around like that with my torch and I'm still running tonight. I'm running, running, I'm running, I'm running. I handed one to Andy. I handed one to Jason. I handed one to Brother Rick. I handed one and said, go, boys, go. I heard a preacher on the radio today. That comes on after I do. That, that preaches a sermon. I handed the torch to uh, years ago. I heard another one yesterday on the radio. That got saved when I was preaching somewhere. I had a torch that said, run, son. Run, run, run. Amen. Just run for God. Just run for God. Listen, if I listened to everybody that tried to get me to quit running, I'd have sat down like most of them. But thank God, brother, the Lord said, get it and run, Castle. And I've been a running by the grace of God ever since. I don't want to let my forefathers die and be beat to death and tied up in some rattlesnakes. Come down just one hour, brother Mike. And, and beat to death and thrown overboard and burned at the stake. And then me laid down the torch in 2004 just because somebody talked about me. Amen. We have the great cloud of witnesses. And I want to tell you something else. We have a goal in mind. We have a goal in mind. The Bible said, looking unto Jesus. Now as I'm running tonight, let's just say I'm running. All right. I'm running my race. And I'm running. And let's just say tonight that, uh, oh, let's say that, uh, that that's the shining light sign there is the Lord in heaven. Now I'm supposed to run. Now you know what? When I'm running up through here, I can see her and I can see him. And I can see her and I can see Dot. And I can see that. But I'm not supposed to look at you. See, you're there, but I'm supposed to keep my eyes on the sign. When we go through the world, you see, you know where we make a mistake? We stop and talk here, and look around here, and look around there. And you start talking. First thing you know, you'd be going back this way. <laughs> you got to keep your eyes on the prize, as the old preacher used to say. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. And so we have a goal in mind. Amen. Well, the Bible said, Consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. I'm going to tell you something this evening. Nobody Nobody here has a reason to quit. Nobody here has a reason to quit. If you've been thinking about quitting, I hope tonight before I get through, God will build a fire into you and set in the, uh, pour a dump of glo uh, glory dose in the gable into your soul and set you on fire like Samson did them fires and say, run, fool, run! And
that you'll just take up for God and get the job done that God gave you today. Some of you know what the Bible said about some people? You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Boy, I remember some of you, when you first got started, you run well. Lord, in mercy, you're passing everybody up. But you have been hindered. And then another reason we run tonight is there's a crown awaiting. There's a crown awaiting. Every one of God's youngins that crosses the finish line gets crowned. Hey, think about it. They're dying tonight. A bunch of God's people died today. Can you imagine them running? Some of them old saints, they've been talked about and people made fun of them. And you know, I, you know, I run all the time, but it's, uh, it's even more harder to run and preach at the same time. And so, you know, and boy, you're like this, you know, hey, you're running through it. And boy, you trip and fall and the devil throws something at you. And next thing you know, you're running this way. Hey, you're running this way. It's pretty fun, man. I'm, I'm on my, you die right now. And boy, you're, whoo, and you cross the finish line and God crowns you. Yeah. You say, I want to do like that. Come on, let's go. Amen. There's a crown awaiting. God crowns all His people as they come in. You know why I keep going? Because there's a crown awaiting on me. Amen. How do we run? I want to say secondly tonight, I'm going to talk about the start of the race. Here's how you got in. Here's how you got in. Admittance. Did you know to run this race, you have to be admitted. Not committed. You have to be admitted. Amen. You must be in Him, registered, and admitted with official admittance. Anybody can't just come and join the race. Many are running, but it'll do them no good because they never have been officially entered in race. Now, if you're going to go run a race out here, uh, like uh, a marathon, like TJ does back there, he runs these big long races, and you know what them races do? You have to be admitted. If you, if you come up there and just said, hey, I'll run with you, it don't matter if you beat all of them. You don't get no prize. You have to be checked in, registered, get a number, get be assigned to a lane, and then you're in the race. That's the first step. Now, when I was 18 years old, I went to the altar at Nebo Baptist Church. God got a hold of my heart. And boy, you know what happened? Somebody done this, and they made an announcement in heaven, and all of a sudden the Lord said this, that, and put His name down. And they put my name down, and all of a sudden the microphone come up, and in heaven they said, Ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in heaven stopped and listened. And the Lord said, Introducing in lane 495,204 from Nebo, North Carolina, Brother Danny Castle! Boom, here I went. And I said, here I go, Lord. Well, I'm ready to go. And boy, I took off just a flying. I said, I don't know where I'm going, but you said, run, I'm running. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to run into a tree. Amen. Uh, but I, amen. And buddy, I'll tell you what, you must be admitted. You must be admitted. You can't get in unless you're admitted. In Philippians chapter uh, uh, 3 and verse number 9, we're in Him. The only way you can get in this race is be in Him. Uh, uh, TJ, I think your mom told me that you're going to be in the Boston... Is it the Boston Marathon? Is that right? And he's going to be in the Boston Marathon pretty soon. That's a big time race. That's a big time race. And boy, he's going to get in that thing. And I'm sure just any old redneck can't just go up and say, I'm in the race. You've got to be admitted. you got to know. I don't know what process you go through, but there's got to be some way he's admitted and officially in that race. I'm going to say to you tonight, when you got saved, God officially put you in the race and you're to run with faith. Are you saved tonight? You're in the race. You qualify. Amen. And you've qualified for the race and you are in. Many people are just wasting their time. They've never been in qualified. And so then come the training. Now, since this is a distance race, then training is very important. You need to get plenty of rest. You, your success depends upon the discipline of your body. Did you hear me? I said your success depends upon the discipline of your body. Man ain't going to be no long distance runner that don't discipline himself. 
Paul said, I keep my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Brother, there are certain things you can't let yourself do and be a good runner for God. It just cannot happen. You've you got you to gotta be training. You've got to be in training. David said in Psalm 119 verse 32, I will run the way of thy mammoths when thou shalt enlarge my heart. David said, i got to get in shape. i got to get in shape. Now, the first thing you're going to do if you're going to run a long-distance race is get in shape. Now, a different. You've heard me say before on a dash. Let's say we was running a hundred-yard dash. Here's what I'd do. I'd stand right here and you'd say, Ready? Set, go! I'd take off like that. I wore the wrong shoes to be running in. I should have worn my tennis shoes. Wore the wrong jacket too. Whoa. wool. Uh, but I want to tell you what, boy. I, I'd stand there and I'd do like this. A uh, 440 yard dash, right? I'd go, go then! I'd take off 90 miles an hour. And if it was a 100 yard dash, let's say from here to the, 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 you know, up here to the store or something like that, man, I'd turn it on up through there. But the Bible said this is a long distance run. So if a man's going to run a long distance, he don't take off 90 miles an hour. You just take off like this. It's like this. He might run like this. Most of us, we just got to go like this right here. And you know what I'm doing? Watch. My heels are hitting on the balls of my feet. You know why? Because I'm going to be doing this a while. We don't know how long. I've been doing 30 years. Just running like this, you know. Just running, 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 running. I don't feel like running. I'll run again. I want to stop. Shut up. I want to go. Let's wait. Rest. No. Hush. We're running. You say, well, something's in our way. We'll run past it. Something got in my way. Run over it. Something's in my way. Climb underneath it. You just keep going. Somebody talking about me. What's the big man got in my way? And you just run right on. Just run right on. Just run right on. And keep going. Now, if I'd have been doing like a hundred yard dash, you can't do that. you burn out. So you got to train. You say, Lord, you're making me tired just watching you. Listen, I'm just saying, that's the way the Christian life is. A spiritual couch potato can't live for God. They're too lazy to do anything for God. Amen. I'm talking about spiritually. That's why they laid in the bed this morning and didn't get up and come to church. Amen. A distance runner's temperament is important. You need oxygen, stamina, and endurance. David said, I'll run when you enlarge my heart. All right. Number three, the rules. Did you know every race has rules? Every one of them. Every race has rules. And every race you get in has certain guidelines you go by or you're disqualified. And the rule number one is lay aside every weight. All runners have this in common. No unnecessary weight. If there's one thing you can't help but notice, if you ever watch one of them long distance runs, is that they shed just as much as they can possibly shed. And I'm not, I'm not talking about, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, uh, I mean, look, be honest with me. If I was going to run in the Morgan and Marathon, I would not be dressed like this. Bible said lay aside every weight. I'd get me some little old lightweight Nikes or Reeboks or something like that. And uh, now this, I'm just speaking as a person now. Don't get it. I'd take his jacket off. I'd take this tie off. I'd take his shirt off. I'd just have on a little old pair of running shorts. I know you, that puts an awful picture in your mind. Uh, but uh, that's it. Shut up. I'd hate to see you too. Amen. Uh, but anyway, I mean, boy, I tell you, and I'd just have on a little old pair of socks that come up to about right here, and I'd have on a little old bitty pair of shoes, and here I'd go. Listen, if I was going to run a race, I would not, I would not have on big old pair of combat boots, and a tea, you know, and a, and a, and a bottles hanging off of me, and knives and guns, and a big old heavy coat, and all that. You lay aside everything. I, have you ever run, you know, play ball? It feels like, you know, if I got on a shirt like this, I'm trying to shoot basketball. It's, it's like, ugh, it's holding you back. You want this shirt? That's why they wear shirts that, that don't, don't restrict you, you know? I'm telling you what, brother, you lay aside every weight. The Bible said we lay aside every weight. You're supposed to get rid of everything. Every 
everything that would hinder us. Listen, there's some things in your life that might not be a sin, but you can run better without them. There's some things that may not be wicked, but you can run better without them. We want to lay aside everything that hinders us, anything that bothers us, and just run and run and run and run and lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. I said this... uh, Said this uh, little queen one time was in this palace, and uh, she, the, the, she was a young virgin, and all the men in the kingdom wanted her. And one day she come out. She was a great runner, and she said, "I'll give myself and marry any one of you that can beat me." And so they raced her, and she beat all of them. And one day the prince came by, and the prince said, "I'll race you," and he got ahead of her and dropped some golden apples. And when the princess came by, she looked down and saw them golden apples. And she couldn't help but just stop and pick one up. And he passed her up and beat her. You know, that perfect picture of how a lot of times we stop and pick something up. We'll stop and do this. We'll stop and do that. Let me tell you something. Every day you stop, the devil gets an edge on you. Every day you stop, the devil... You go one day without reading your Bible, the devil gets an edge. I'm telling you, today we're living in, buddy. Hey, listen, you can't let up one day. You can't sit down one minute. You can't slack up an hour. It seems like the devil will run right past you. I asked somebody the other day, I said, you been reading your Bible? No. Been reading your Bible? No. I asked somebody the other day, I said, uh, have, have you read your Bible lately? No. I asked somebody else, you been reading your Bible? No. Somebody, don't even go to this church, so don't think I'm talking about you. It could be, but it ain't. Uh, I, I asked somebody the other day, I said, when's the last time you read your Bible? This lady said, three days ago. I said, it ain't no wonder the devil's ahead. It ain't no wonder the devil's ahead of you. You've got to lay aside every weight and brother, just get on fire and run on for God. I'll tell you something else the rules are. The rules are you must stay in a signed lane. Now, you ever seen these like a race and stuff? You got lanes. And I never have figured out how that's fair. Maybe, maybe some of y'all can tell me. But you're all running in a circle. Lane number one, two, three, four, five, six. You like this fellow on the inside got a lot shorter track than that fellow on the outside. But I know they line them up this way where it makes it fair, but honest to goodness, it still seems like it ain't fair. And you're running. Whatever lane, you've got to stay in your assigned lane. Now, when God sent me, He gave me a lane to run in. It took me a few years to figure out what it was. I, when I first got saved, I thought I wanted to be an evangelist. I thought I want to be an evangelist and travel all over the country and preach all over the place. And somebody said, don't you want me a pastor? I said, no, I don't think I do. And it wasn't God put it in my heart to be a pastor and an evangelist. So I got to do both. And I have ever since I've been starting. I praise God for that. I know what my lane is. My lane is not being in a college somewhere teaching Greek. Thank God. My lane tonight is not to be an associational missionary. Thank God. My lane tonight is not uh, uh, to go to Timbuktu, you know, and work with me, which that would be all right if it was, but that's not. You know what my lane is? My lane is to preach to people in the Bible Belt and get as many as I can saved and stir up the saints and try to start something in the churches and send out young people to do something for God. That is my lane. And brother, when God lets me, I'm going to run in my lane. I learned a long time ago, I can't run in brother so-and-so's lane. I can't run in brother so-and-so. As a matter of fact, if I step out of my lane, I'm out of the race. My job is to do my job. And wouldn't it be a blessing tonight if everybody would just do what they're supposed to and stay in their lane, keep those out of everybody else's business, and run for God and stay on fire and stay in your lane. All right, here I go. I'm running in my lane. Oh, here I go. Now, um, let's see here. When do you boys want to run a little bit? Come on, Rod. Run. You can, come on. All right. All right. Run. All right. Now, Andy's got his lane. I've got my lane. All right. Here we go. Going back this way. He's got his lane. I've got my lane. Ready? Here we go. Here, he's got his lane. Come on. <laughs> hey, I've got my lane. Come on. He's got his lane. He's older than me. Don't, you don't need to feel sorry for him. All right, now look here. Now, he's not supposed to be judging me. I'm not supposed to be going, I can't stand the way he runs. He's not running. It's you. I believe he's a queer. I tell you what. Listen. It ain't none of my business how he runs. 
Amen? Amen. If I'm busy doing what I'm supposed to be doing, it don't make a hoot how he's running. And I just say, well, I don't like them tennis shoes he's got on. Them tennis shoes ain't like my tennis shoes. He don't tie them right. And he don't run right. He runs like this. That's the way a girl runs. Here's the way a girl throws a ball. Not all of them, just most of them. And boy, I tell you what, listen, I don't like, it's none of my business how he runs. None of his business how I run. We need to stay in our assigned lane. Amen? You say, well, I'll tell you one thing, Brother Danny. There's some stuff going on at the church. Yeah, I know, you're not out so winning. Isn't that awful? Isn't that awful? That's awful. Let me tell you what, brother. It ain't none of your business what brother so-and-so did or sister so-and-so thought or somebody else said. Get in your life and run for God and you won't have time to talk about everybody else. If everybody just do what they're supposed to, you wouldn't have time to look at somebody else how they're running or not running. Amen. Stay in your lane. I got some preachers, preachers across the country, and if I died today, they'd lose half their sermons. Hey, really, really. I hey, preach about me. When I'm supposed to go preach somewhere, I'm supposed to go preach in Paducah, Kentucky. You know where Paducah, Kentucky is? It's way out here on the other side of Memphis. And you go up in Oakland's there, past Memphis, and I'm supposed to preach revival there. And there's a young preacher there. He called me the night. I was packing my clothes on Wednesday night. And uh, he said, uh, I said, uh, hey, brother, I'll be there tomorrow evening. He said, brother Danny, we got problems. It's been a few years ago. I said, what's up, brother? He said, the preacher emailed me told me if I let you come to this church, he was going to do this and he was going to do that. And all that. I said, where's that preacher from? He said, I don't know, somewhere down in South Carolina. And I thought, well, what? listen, brother, me and you got a meeting planned. I said, well, I've already prayed about this. A whole bunch of young people there Friday night. And we was going to do the message on Marilyn Manson. And a bunch of them going to get saved. Do you really believe God laid it on that preacher's heart to call you and try to stop it? He said, brother, I don't know. I said, okay, the pastor, he's just a young boy in his 20s. And I said, you're the pastor. If you don't feel right about it, you tell me. Be no hard feeling. He said, I just don't think. I said, okay, I'll abide by your wishes. We won't have the meeting. But I said, I'm telling you something. All them kids that would have got saved Friday night, somebody's going to answer to God for it one of these days. And i tell you who it is. It's that big mouth preacher in South Carolina that ought to just stay in his lane and win somebody to God and let God take care of me. Same man right there. On the count of three. One, two, three. Yeah, hallelujah, brother. We ought to just get busy for God. Listen, there ain't enough devils in hell or out of hell to stop me and shining like Baptist church if we'll run for God like we're supposed to and just stay in our lane and just keep all a burning that flag. Amen. Waving the flag. I was going to say burning the torch and I said burn the flag. Woo! Amen. What a blessing. Amen. We're supposed to run with patience. Hallelujah. Castle's preaching, burning the flag now. Now we're getting somewhere. Now look, here's what you got to do in a distance run. You got to have a little bit of that. Hear that? You're... That's that. Some of you had not done that in years and years and years. Oh, here I go. I'm not even thinking about quitting. I ain't even thinking about it. My body says, won't you stop? Shut up. It says, I'm getting tired. Tough. I hate it. I don't feel like going today. We're going anyway. You said, the kids are sick. Well, who gives a hoop? So I don't feel, I feel bad. I can't help it. Well, I'm too sick to go. As soon as I get better, I'm going back. You say, well, trouble at the church. I'm going anyway. You say, Brother Danny, it's cold. I'm going anyway. Go to, that's what you've got to do. To stay on fire for God. You can't quit just because you get tired. You can't quit. I know people say, boy, I'm going to go out and run. And it rains and they don't run. Y'all know I run every day. Except Saturday and uh, Sunday sometimes. And the other day, it was like 15 degrees. And the devil said, you going to run today? I don't really think it's the devil. I think it's just... My mind says, it's too cold. You'll get pneumonia. And so I put on a sweatshirt and another sweatshirt. And I put on one of these big old uh, 
hoods, you know, it's got these eyes in it. These, <laughs> that looks stupid. I look, got these uh, toboggan that you pull down the base. It's got these eyes cut out. And I pulled the hood on me. So here I went running down the road. My dogs always go with me. There, so here we go, running down the road. I felt stupid. I said, well, nobody won't recognize me. I, you know, but they all know they see me every day uh, going down to Hoppy Tom. So, look, you say, Brother, why you do that? I was in Arkansas, New York, everywhere, and it's snowing outside. I said, man, I'm not running today. Now, my motto is, if Rocky can do it, bless God, I can do it. That's my motto. And I never even watched the rock. I'm not part of that old one. Sometimes we can go weeks and not much happening. Nobody's saved. It gets kind of boring. And That's wintertime. You run on. Sometimes it's hot. Like youth rally, boy. It's just popping. Man, hey, listen. When it's, when it's 100 degrees, Mom says, Danny, you better not. She's sitting back there. She said, son, it's too hot. You'll have a heat stroke. Listen, I played basketball, full court, in 100 degree weather. Don't believe that stuff. It's good for you. The more you sweat, the better off you'll be. Amen. God, God said man to make his living by the sweat of his what? Face. Face. They don't say brow. And uh, uh, listen, it says face. And God wants us to sweat, brother. God wants us to sweat. It's good. Now, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. He, you have to put forth an effort. It ain't going to drop in your lap. It's got to, you've got to force yourself sometimes. You've got to make yourself read your Bible. Sometimes you have to make yourself pray. People say, well, if you have to make yourself, it ain't no good. Well, sure it is. What if T.J. got over and said, well, I don't feel like today. If you have to make yourself, it ain't no good. It's good for you whether you have to make yourself. You want to do it yourself. Amen? Amen. Run with patience. Run with patience. That's why when you run along this, you go like this. Now, if I was running fast, nothing would touch the ground but my boots. <laughs> but if I'm running a long way, boom, boom. Boom, boom. I catch you. And oh, you're just running, and you're just running, and you're just running, and you're running some more, and you're running some more. You better take your time. We may be doing this another 20 years. I used to think the Lord's coming back. When I first got saved, I thought the Lord would come back in a couple of years, and He didn't. I said, man, I better slow down. Ain't no telling how long we're going to be doing this. See, that's why I said, with patience. I've seen a lot of them quit. I'm going to say this tonight, fourthly, the finish of the race. It's not who runs the fastest or the prettiest, but who crosses the finish line. That's where the Lord comes or calls. Now, listen to me. Here's where a lot of people, people come to revival and people come to camp meeting. Son, I'm telling you, they get on fire for God. Bang! You take off, you think, Lord, they're going to outrun everybody. And half a mile up the road, there they sit. On the side, on the bank somewhere. I thought you was on fire for God. Man, I'm tired. See, got tired of being talked about. I got tired of my husband cussing me out every time I went to church. I got tired of fighting the devil. I got tired of not getting to do what I want. I got tired of fighting temptation. I got tired. Listen, brother, you have to make up your mind. It's a fight from the day you start to the day you leave this world. And you stay in there. Somebody is tired of fighting. That's why you give in some I'll never forget in, in high school playing ball. We'd have twenty boys show up for basketball practice the first day. And our coach, I knew him. I knew him. I played for him, you know, and, and see him in eighth grade and played with him in ninth grade, tenth grade, tenth and twelfth grade. And I was in school a year ahead of my Everybody in my class was a year older than me. I graduated from high school. I hadn't been but 17, but just a few months. So everybody else in my class was 18, and I was 16 in the 12th grade. So I was really supposed to have another. Daddy sneaked me in at Clinksville. He did. My daddy took me to Clinksville school, said, I ain't smart enough, and put me in there and snuck me in somehow or another, and I got a year's head start. And I got saved right after, so I know it was God that had His hand and all that all alone. Because I got saved right after I got out of school. But you'd be surprised the stuff that starts. I'll come back to my coach's story in a minute. You'd be surprised as you're running along. You'd think after all these years, I'd just run right on. Nothing wouldn't bother me, would you? But it don't never quit bothering you. And if you're sitting here tonight saying, the devil don't bother me. The world don't bother me. They ain't nothing. 
you are either lying or you've done quit running and forgot what it feels like to be in the race. One of the two. Because the devil never gives up on you. Because you're dead and gone, the devil don't quit. Listen, Brother Danny, been preaching all these years. Guess what happened to me the other day? I was in, oh, he, me and Kurt. That's probably why I haven't hanging out with him. Amen, brother. God bless you. Follow me now. Amen. I was with him over there at Lowe's the other day. And I read this guy that I played in a band with. And I played in a band when I was 13 and quit it when I was 14. I done went through rock music when I was 14 because I started playing basketball all the time. And this boy said this. He said, hey, Dan. I said, how you doing? He said, listen, so-and-so called me the other day. He wanted me to call you. He said, we want to get the old band back together and play some songs. That's honestly what he said. And you know the devil said, ah, well, you know, just play a few little old tunes. It ain't wicked like it is nowadays. I tell you, I even thought that. I shook my head and I said, you know I can't do that. He said, oh, we'll just get together and play some old songs. He said, you remember? I said, yeah, I remember every one of them. I remember the words. I can tell you the chords. I remember every single one of them. And I can do them better now than I could then. Because the Lord has taught me how to play all these years. And he said, we'll just get together for a little jam session. You know, little my girl. You see, things like that it ain't really wicked. It ain't about worse than the devil or nothing. You know. And listen, when I was, something said, well, what would be wrong with that? I said, God! And I thought, just, that's all we need all over town. Any castles in a rock band. Big Mr. Preacher that preaches on rock music all over the world and is in a rock band. But boy, the devil never quits, does he? He never quits. You quit in 20 years and one of your buddies will show up. Hey, let's have a cold. And, and you, know, you can get saved and stay right with God a long time. And watch one of your old friends. One of your old friends will call you up and say, Hey, just for old time's sake. Yeah. Has that ever happened to any of you? Just for old time's sake. Listen, that ain't ever happened to me. And I feel wicked for even thinking about it. I, I thought, God! And the devil said, what would be wrong with some of them? I said, I don't reckon it'd be really wrong, but just the, the principle, man. The principle! I'm waiting on them to call me just any day now. But how our coach did, he'd come out there and he'd say, all right, boys, there'd be 20 boys wanting to play ball. He'd only keep 12. That means eight had to go. First string, second string, and two more, whatever they were. Um, I don't know if you know where string, second string stuff comes from, but I read the illustration on that the other day. If I can remember that, I'd tell you. And uh, Coach came there and he said, All right, boys, you know what them freshmen thought? You know what them ninth and tenth graders thought? Well, ninth graders. They thought, Man, I'm going out for basketball. You going out there? The coach always started on October 15th because everybody wanted to go squirrel hunting. And he said, if you want to play, you want to go squirrel hunting more than you want to play basketball, you're out. Man, everybody wanted to go squirrel hunting. Back then, boys brought guns to school. Boys brought shotguns to school in the back of their truck. And no principal got shot, no teacher got shot. Guns ain't the problem. The stupid rock videos is what's called. And the movies is the problem. Amen. Amen. Guns didn't cause that mess at Columbine. We didn't shoot teachers and stuff. We shot squirrels. Right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And you know what? Some of them go squirrel hunting. The coach said they don't want to play. Man, our coach was tough. He's good too. He's a great coach. And he said, if you don't put basketball first, you ain't playing. And he always told us, and we didn't pay no attention. And he said, put God first, basketball second. Well, yeah, right. You know, we put basketball first. We wasn't safe. So here's what he done. Them boys stop. Here we are. We got our shorts on. We got our t-shirts on. We're ready. We're going to choose up and play, ain't we? Let me tell you something. Them first week of practice, you was lucky if you got to touch basketball. You know what you've done? Run your fool head off. That's all. The first day, that's all you've done. If you got to do a few layups, you thought, well, hallelujah. You didn't say hallelujah. You said, whatever we said. I was going to say, praise God. What we said. 
Hot diggity dog or something. Uh, listen, uh, you, if you got to touch a basketball, you, you know what he done? He'd say, all right, run. And here we'd go. And you know what them freshmen would do? He said, run laps. I'm going to watch you. So the freshmen, wanting to impress the coach, they go, that's the way they go. So then they'd start off. Now, we that have been there a few years, here's the way we started off. You know why? Because we knew. So then he'd go in there and sit down in his office and drink coffee and just look out there where he can see us. So we'd just do it like this. And here goes them boys. Class like, hey, what's wrong with you old men? Can't you keep up with us? We said, yeah, yeah, you go right ahead there. Because we knew 20 minutes would go by. We're still doing this. 25 minutes go by. We'll still be doing this. You know why? We knew, we knew. Have you ever tried to run and preach? It's kind of cool, man. Y'all try sometime. Oh, yeah. We run this way, run that way, run the other way. We run up over things. We jump things. Just kept going. Just like that. In about five or ten minutes, we saw some of them super dupers over here going like this. <laughs> and saw some of them, after about ten minutes, doing like this. <laughs> Coming out their nose to their supper. Listen, I've been saved a long time. I've been running for the Lord. Running for the Lord. Boy, have I ever seen them, any of them. All you people has been with me for years. Haven't we seen a bunch of them? They'll come in there, sit on the front row. Whoa, God, I got it. I'll win the world. About three weeks later, they're drunk. Or out on drugs. You better just take your time, settle down, get good rhythm, and stay with it. Because we're going to be doing this a while. You better, you better run with patience. Boy, I remember reading about David Livingston. And David Livingston was a missionary in South Africa. And David Livingston went down in there, didn't see his wife for three years. Didn't see his wife for three years. According to that, according to some of these modern day preachers, that'd be a terrible husband. But he was out doing the work for God and didn't see his wife for three years. They couldn't afford for her to come to Africa. And he saw a native come out and a, a lion eat him. Literally eat a native. And a lion come and grabbed his arm. Almost tore his arm off. Almost tore his arm off. So much that his arm was like this and he had to learn how to shoot his gun left-handed because he couldn't hold it out like that. And that old boy stayed on the mission field and kept running. Now what was what was that? Some of y'all told me the reason you couldn't run no more. I said man got his arm tore off, people. He got his arm tore off. And when he died, they shipped his body back to Glasgow, England, to bury him and cut his heart out where his heart was and buried it in Africa. And he hadn't saw his wife in three years. And when he saw her, he said, Honey, I know you have bad news. And she didn't say, I'm going to divorce you for being gone so long. She said, I can't even tell you the bad news for the joy that I have of seeing you after three years. Waited on that man three years while he was in the jungles. Son, they, listen, I tell you stories tonight for them people, them people back hundreds of years ago, they had guts. When they started out for God, listen, what's wrong with some of you teenagers? Some of you young people, teenagers here tonight, you shouldn't even carry a Bible to school. Tell anybody at school you're a witness. Tell them you're a Christian. Some of you people in here tonight go to work every day and the people don't even know that you belong to Jesus. Then we run, we run, we run. And we run some more. And the coach would come out. And then you know what we'd do? We'd do stuff like that. And then we'd do them stupid we call them suicides. Lord have mercy. Quarter court wind sprints. Where you run here, go back. Run the high court, go back. Run the three court, go back. Run all the way, go back. Run, 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 run. And ever since I've been preaching, I never got about that. 
And every, when I'm running, when I'm running during the day, I usually run in the morning. And uh, I'm running down the road like this, and I'm think almost every day I think this is my life. And you know when I get to where I'm going down Hoppy Tom, and I stop and I say, "This is a halfway point in my life." When I first started out, I wanted to quit. Before I got down my driveway, I wanted to quit. But I kept running. Now I've got it half over. Man, I only like about two thirds or about one third of it, and I'll be done. I believe I'm going. Man, when I come around that last curve, and then I see my driveway, I thought, "Glory to God, I got it made." You know, when you first start out, you get discouraged and you want to quit, and your family makes fun of you, and people talk about you, and then some of you're about a third of the way, some of you're maybe done got half of it over with. Surely I've got half of it over with. Lord, I hope I ain't. Even, I hope I'm over halfway. <laughs> But I tell you what I feel like tonight. I feel like running. There are no crown wearers in heaven that were not cross bearers on earth. A man is not crowned unless he strive lawfully. Run by the rules. I remember reading about the days of Nero. And in the time of Nero, the church went through more persecution than probably any time in history. And the church was persecuted big time in the days of Nero. He killed Christians, burned them at the stake, killed them all the time. And at that time, there was a fellow by the name of Vespasian. And Vespasian was a centurion. You know what a centurion is? What does centurion sound like? Cent, C-E-N-T? Century. Hundred. He's a man over a hundred people. And he had a hundred slaves working for Nero. And word came down from Nero. He said, if any of them fellows are Christians, they'll pay with their life. We'll kill them if they're saved, if they're Christians. So Vespasian comes out. He had a hundred men. And he said, has any of you embraced the Christian faith? And 40 of his best men stepped forward. And they said, we're Christians and will not deny our Lord. And that crowd at that time had a had a little, uh, um, like a slogan. And um, it was this. It was 40, it was 100. 100 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O King, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And they'd all say it together. 100 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O King, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. All together. 100 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O King, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And that was their slogan. Torian stepped up and said, We'll trust Jesus. And Vespasian said, Hey man, I don't want to kill you guys. You're some of the best, you're some of the best uh, workers that I've got. And he said, I'm going to tell you boys something. I'm going to give you to sundown to deny Jesus Christ. And if you deny Him, you'll go free. And if you cling to that faith, we'll kill you. And sundown come and he said, who's want to stand for God? And 40 of them stepped up there and said, 40 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And he said, I don't want to kill you. And the lake was froze. And he said, take off walking on that frozen lake right there. He said, walk on that frozen lake until it breaks in with you and you die. And so they made them strip their clothes off, go on barefooted, and started walking. Forty men out there on that lake going out like this. And ladies and gentlemen, they started walking out through there. And this patient and the men sat beside the fire and watched those forty men walk out there to icy grave with no clothes on except maybe a rag around their, their mid parts. And they were walking barefooted. And as they were walking, they were saying, Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win from thee the victory and for thee the crown. And they'd walk a little further and they'd say, Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. And they heard them, could hear them way off in the distance. And Vespasian said, My goodness, I can't stand to hear them men. Got guts. They got guts. That's what the world needs to see me and you have. Some guts. Hey, listen. 
If you start out for God and then you give up, your family, people you know at school, everybody's going to say, see there, they wasn't nothing to him to start with. But we, every one of us ought to pray to God, kill me before you let me quit. Amen. Amen. Just put me in a grave before I give up on God. And they started going out through there and it got darker and colder and darker and colder. And all of a sudden, here come one of them men coming back and saying, I recant! I recant! I'm freezing! I don't want to die! And he come back to the fire and got warm. warm. And them fellas kept walking and said, 39 wrestlers wrestling for the old Christ to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. 39 wrestlers wrestling for the old Christ to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. Vespasian started shaking. He said, anybody that's got a God that real must be real. And he threw off his jacket, took off his shoes, the leader of the, the centurion, and run after them guys saying, wait. And then they said, 40 wrestlers wrestling for the old Christ to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. The song says, I started out traveling many years ago. I'm telling you, son, there's been some water under the bridge. I could not stand here tonight and tell you what all I've been through and seen on this race. But I can say it's been worth every mile. It's been worth every trial. Wouldn't take nothing from my journey now. And if I had to do over, I'd do it all again. I'd try to do it better, but I'd do it all again. I don't regret a mile. I've traveled for the Lord. I'll read you this and I'm through tonight. I read this poem the first Sunday that Shining Light Baptist Church started. It reminds me of me. I don't know who wrote it, but every time, once in a while, I get it out and read And you just pardon me tonight just for a minute as I read it. It's called The Race. Quit. Give up. You're beat. They shouted and pled. There's too much against you now. This time you can't succeed. And as I started to hang my head in front of failure's face, my downward fall is broken by the memory of a race. And hope refills my wind wheel as I recall that scene. For just the thought of that short race rejuvenates my being. A children's race. Young boys, like when I first started out preaching. Young men. I remember so well. Excitement, sure. Also fear. It wasn't hard to tell. They all lined up so full of hope. Each thought to win the race. Or tie for first. If not that, at least take second place. And fathers watched from off the side. Each cheering for his son. And each hoped to show his dad that he'd be the one that won. The whistle blew and off they went. Young hearts and hopes on fire. To win... Be the hero there was each boy's desire. And one boy in particular, his dad was in the crowd, was running near the lead and thought, my dad will be so proud. But as he speeded down the field, keep them quiet, close the door. Across a shallow dip, his hand, the little boy who thought to win, lost his step and slipped. Trying hard to catch himself, his hands flew out to brace. And mid the laughter of the crowd, he fell flat upon his face. So he fell, and with him hope, he couldn't win it now. Embarrassed, sad, he only wished to disappear somehow. But as he fell, his dad stood up and showed his anxious face. So the boy so clearly said, Get up! win that race. He quickly rose, no damage done, behind a bit, that's all, and ran with all his mind and might to try to make up for his fall. So anxious to restore himself to catch up and to win, his mind went faster than his legs. He slipped and fell again. He wished that he had quit before with only one disgrace. I'm hopeless as a runner now. I shouldn't even try to race. But in the open crowd, he searched and found his father's face. That steadily looked, that said, Get up! And win that race. 
So he jumped up to try again, ten yards behind the last. If I'm going to gain those yards, he thought, I've got to run really fast. Exceeding everything he had, he regained eight or ten, but trying so hard to catch the lead, he slipped and fell again. Defeat, he lay there silently. A tear dropped from his eye. There ain't no sense running anymore. Three strikes, I'm out. Why try? The will to rise had disappeared. All hope had fled away. So far behind, so error prone, closer all the way. I've lost. What's the use, he thought. I'll live with my disgrace. But then he thought about his dad, whom soon he'd have to face. Get up, an echo sounded low. Get up and take your place. You're not meant for failure. Get up and win the race. With borrowed will, get up, it said. You haven't lost at all. For winning's not more than this, to rise. Each time you fall. That's what winning is, people. It's to keep getting up. So up he rose to win once more. And with him a new commit. He resolved that win or lose, at least he wouldn't quit. So far behind the others now, the most he'd ever been. Still he gave it all he had and ran as though to win. Three times he'd fallen stumbling. Three times he rose again. Too far behind to hope to win. He still ran until the end. They cheered the winning running runner as he crossed the first place. Head high, proud, and happy. No falling, no disgrace. But when the fallen youngster crossed the line, last place, the crowd gave him a greater cheer just for finishing <laughs> the race. And even though he came in last with head bound down, unproud, you'd have thought he'd have won that race to listen to that crowd. And to his dad, he sadly said, I didn't do so well. To you won, the father said. You rose each time you fell. And now when things seem dark and hard and difficult to face, the memory of that little boy helps me in my race. For all of life is like that race, with ups and downs and all. You have to do to win is rise each time you fall. Quit. Give up. You're beat. They still shout in my face. But another voice inside me says, get up and win that race. Let's stand by his